So welcome to the first of what I hope are many podcasts on um, OpenCL. And we'll be talking about OpenCL, what it is, uh, how you can use it uh, for your uh, computations and, and things like that. And, uh, and hopefully you'll find these, uh, these, these things useful. These uh, tutorials are being brought to you by uh, Mac Research. Uh, my name is Dave Gohara, and I'm with, uh, obviously, Mac Research, but I'm also with the Center for Computational Biology at uh, the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And, um, you know, hopefully you'll find these, uh, these, these things very useful, and if, or at least uh, interesting. And um, if you need to get in touch with me, my email is up there. If you have any questions or things like that, there will be also some resources on macresearch.org over time uh, related to OpenCL and, and, and certainly related to, to anything that these podcasts have, like um, uh, files and, and, and extra, extra stuff and goodies and things like that. So uh, why don't we get going? Um, OpenCL, uh, what is it? OpenCL stands for Open Computing Language. And um, it was initially proposed by Apple. Um, in uh, 2008, and uh, there's a number of other big companies that are involved in uh, developing the OpenCL specification. I mean, OpenCL is actually a specification; it's not a it's not a particular specific technology per se. And um, the other companies that are involved with it, there's there's quite a few. Uh, some of the big ones are Nvidia, uh, AMD, Intel, uh, I believe Imagination Technologies. It's 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 a really large list of. Uh, of companies, so there are, there are a lot of companies that are putting a lot of backing into this technology, and um, and uh, it ho hopefully it, it'll it'll prove to be to be uh, very useful um, for computing, and specifically uh, computing that's really designed for uh, number crunching. Uh, that is, OpenCL is really designed to help people take advantage of all of the computing power on their computers for uh, a, a variety of um, tasks, but really for tasks that are, that are, um, uh, that are parallel computing tasks that uh, take, take a long time and that really need a lot of horsepower to complete. Uh, the OpenCL uh, specification is maintained by the Kronos group. Uh, they're the same group that maintains the um, uh, specifications for OpenGL and a few other uh, technologies that are out there, open, open spec technologies. Um, because OpenCL is a, really a specification, uh, what that means is that for in order for you to actually use it or do something with it, uh, it has to actually be implemented by someone. That is, somebody has to read through the specification. They have to, you know, build up the libraries and the frameworks and, and all of the resources that are required to actually make it go and make it work. And, and this is actually very similar to the way OpenGL works as well. OpenGL is a specification and numerous vendors, uh, Apple included, but uh, numerous ven other vendors uh, write their own OpenGL implementations for use on their hardware and with their software and things like that, and uh, the 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 important thing about this is that uh, it's it's like OpenGL, it's an open standard, which means that anybody can really adopt it and and can write their own implementation. Um, and and the the only th important thing for anybody who's who's building an implementation is that they have to make sure that if they want to be compliant with it, uh, they have to conform to the specification. That is. You have to make sure that you meet all of the minimum sort of requirements that the specification lays out in your implementation, and if you do, um, then you've then, then then you have a compliant implementation, and uh, and and you can sort of carry the OpenCL type brand, if if you will, or whatnot. So uh, that that's that's uh, an important thing to consider. Um, so why do we care about OpenCL, and, and what's what's the big deal here? Well. Is you know, computation performance has, has shifted from clock speed to cores. Uh, there was a time where you just make the the CPU run faster. Uh, a lot of you know this already, but just you know, for for the sake of uh, completeness, uh, you know, you, you increase the clock speed, you get more performance. You, you kind of get it for free and for cheap almost. And I say that knowing that it's it's really not uh, that simple. But um, there's there's a lot of engineering that goes into it. But you know the the idea being that on a single CPU you can just increase the performance and and, and uh, the clock speed and you can get more performance out of it. Whereas now people are looking to using multiple cores and and uh, so just a bunch of CPUs stuffed in a box effectively. And the problem with that is that uh, programming paradigms haven't kept up with that. That is, you know, we we've constantly been focused on you know how do we get the most performance out of a single CPU and and what can we do and let's write our applications and our programs that way not thinking in terms of well we might have multiple CPUs in a computer and how do we really split up our, our, our programs or how do we split up the algorithms which is even more important uh, you know the the parts that, that really do the heavy lifting how do we 
write these algorithms so that we can get the most uh, performance across multiple cores where uh, data might not necessarily be shared or may not be shared efficiently or and, and things like that and and we'll talk about those things in more detail as, as these uh, podcasts go go on but OpenCL is also uh, important because uh, it's designed to sort of take all of the um, all of the various devices and all of the various uh, pieces of hardware in your computer um, and, and kind of gl- like function is like a kind of like a glue to kind of make it so that you can get access to all of these resources. Um, OpenCL is, um, it, uh, of course, is a programming interface, and so really the, the idea is that, you know, you have all of these resources, they're sitting there. You may only be using, you know, some small subset of them. Uh, why not? Let's just try to open it up and get more access to the uh, to all of those system resources. And so really OpenCL is designed to support general purpose um, parallel computations. That is, uh, calculations and, and computations that aren't, um, say, just specifically multimedia, um, where you'd have a, a dedicated DSP chip, let's say, um, or um, uh, you know, graphics-only application. You might want to do scientific calculations, or you might want to do um, some other things, or you know, with it. And so, OpenCL is really designed to just kind of give you a, a, a good framework to build your applications on top of, so that you can harness some of the underlying computational power. OpenCL, uh, unlike some other technologies, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit, bit about, is designed to be device agnostic. Um, and I'll give you an example of, uh, of devices in a second. But what that really means is that OpenCL, again, as a specification, doesn't dictate what it runs on. It just says, for you to be OpenCL compliant, you must meet these, these requirements. But you could be pretty much anything, if, as long as you can meet those requirements. Probably more important is that OpenCL being an open standard means that your uh, code should be portable across implementations. So if one company, let's say Apple, has an implementation of OpenCL and that implementation is compliant with the standard, then uh, if you were to move over to Linux or Windows or something um, suicidal like that, then um, you uh, should be able to port your code and you shouldn't really have to worry about that. It's the same with OpenGL, the same way OpenGL works, right? You can write your code and as long as they support that specification or that version of the specification on whatever target platform you're on it should all work and then of course you know the specification since it's um, managed uh, and maintained by Kronos that means that no single company controls the specification and so you don't have to worry about things becoming proprietary or, or closed now the implementation itself may be proprietary and closed but the specification is an open specification so anybody can uh, compete in that space uh, let's talk about OpenCL devices, I guess. Uh, when, I, when I say devices, what I'm really referring to commonly are CPUs and GPUs. Uh, but again, it just has to be any type of hardware that meets um, the minimum requirements of the specification. So again, it could be a DSP chip, it could be an FPGA, um, any type of embedded processor, you name it. As long as it can meet the requirements um, for the specification, it can be an OpenCL device. And this is important because as time goes on and people start maybe building dedicated um, pieces of hardware for specific functions, you might want to be able to, they, they might do something that you want to take advantage of and you might want to get access to that hardware. And so as long as the implementation supports that hardware, then you don't have to worry about the details. You write your code by and large once. Uh, you might have to do some tuning here and there, but minor stuff, and you can take advantage of it with, with very little effort. So it allows you uh, flexibility and the, the ability to move from device to device without having to reinvent the wheel every single time. And I think that's probably one of the most powerful things about OpenCL. Um, the goals of OpenCL. Uh, OpenCL is designed to really be a clean, simple API uh, for accessing all of the various devices in your in your um, system for performing general purpose high performance computing. Uh, it's a uh, it's sort of an extension of the uh, C99. Uh, it's not really an extension. It it it, it it's it's based off of uh, C. Uh, it has C99 language support. Uh, they've added uh, some additional data types, some built-in functions, additional qualifiers. Um, and it can really be thought of as like a f- uh, as a thread management framework, um, the ability to manage a lot of things going on um, under the hood, so you don't have to worry about the details of of creating and destroying threads and and various things like that, locks and and all the things that you have to worry about um, on on using other technologies, some of which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, 
it, again, it needs to be easy to use. It needs to be lightweight and efficient. It should not be a, a significant hog on the system. Uh, it should really allow you to take advantage of everything you've got in your really expensive computer that you spend a lot of money on. Um, but more important, it also needs to um, guarantee, give you certain guarantees. You need to know that when you move from um, specification to specification that uh, you're going to get the same numerical results. At the very least, you'll get a minimum set of numerical results. Um, it's, um, it needs to supply, um, ideally, some math functions, and that those math functions should be guaranteed to return at least a minimum value of accuracy. But it also um, provides guidelines for new hardware. So as people are designing new chips or new pieces of hardware, they can also design them uh, with this specification in mind or, or, or new, new specifications uh, in mind as they, as, as uh, new versions of the specification, I should say, as they come along. So that's also important. So where can we use OpenCL? Well, we can use OpenCL um, in a lot of applications, in a lot of places. This is not purely for scientific computing. It's not purely for image and video processing. Uh, it can be used also for medical imaging. Um, it can be used for, for financial purposes. A, a lot of computing is moving over in, in the financial uh, services uh, you've kept up with some of these things um, for you know how we can do trades as fast as possible well that's you know uh, data locality um, but it's also being able to crunch through and, and, and to look through a lot of information quickly and, and things like that and for uh, generating and, 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 and analyzing uh, financial models and, and data so OpenCL can be used uh, across a wide variety of, of things but really it's designed and can be used with any kind of uh, data parallel algorithm where the computational part is uh, significant, meaning that it's not just like a trivial kind of hello world app or something silly like that. Something that really takes a lot of time and a lot of computational resources to get through. So when we say data, data parallel computing, what are we really talking about? Well, data parallel computing, um, you know, we're there's, there's, there's a huge spectrum of things. Um, and if we're just sort of break it down, we refer to the granularity. Um, in coarse grain uh, parallel computing, we might be talking about grid computing. Um, and as we move down the list, we might talk about, you know, finer things where open MPI or, um, you know, within a single system, we might be talking about P-threads or open MP, just standard threading models and, and things like that. Or we might be talking about very, very fine grain parallelism where we're talking about SIMD, uh, single instruction, multiple data. Um, these are things like SSE and AltaVec and, 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 and vector, uh, vector um, engines and things like that. So, um, it, it you know it, it covers a, a, a wide range of things. Really, what we're talking about here with um, with uh, OpenCL, we're really talking about the the last two, which is OpenMPP thread type things and SIMD, uh, for the most part. That's not to say that you can't use any of these technologies or these these um, computing models interchangeably or mix and match them. You certainly can, and people do uh, to to. To, to great effect, but um, in, in the case of OpenCL, we're really talking about um, the, the, the last two. Now, when we talk about data parallel computing in the context of OpenCL, we're really talking about two things. Uh, we're talking about task parallelism, and in this case, we're talking about, uh, it's, it's, you could think of this as kind of like a coarse grain uh, um, distribution model, but within a single system where, let's say, you know, each task uh, is uh, your program is running and you have you know a bunch of images that you want to do the exact same thing to? Um, you could use OpenCL to say okay you know to farm out the images to the different CPUs and say okay you deal with this one you deal with that one etc and so forth. I mean that might be one example of say let's task parallelism. Probably what we're going to focus on the most here is really sort of data parallelism where we're talking about you know let's say an array of numbers like we have here um, and we want to perform the same operation or sets of operations these could be complex functions uh, on a individual piece of data um, so for example in this example we're taking the absolute value where you know we want to you know take the absolute value of this uh, number and this number and this number and this is a data parallel task because I don't need to know the absolute value of this element here to calculate the absolute value of this element here so that is a data parallel task that we can do and something that we can do very well in OpenCL. This is the kind of thing that OpenCL is really designed to um, excel at. So let me give you another example, like a, like a sort of real world example of, um, of uh, a data parallel task. In this case we're going to talk about the box filter and, and for this example I've got a picture here um, and the picture I'm just going to um, effectively blur. And so what we do is, in a box filter, is you, you take a, a set of 
pixels in a box. Let's just look at this one down here. We take a, a set of pixels, and what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the average value. Uh, we're going to sum these all up and then divide by the total number of pixels to calculate the average value. And that value is going to be placed right in the middle of the box. The pixel at the middle of this box is what's going to get that new value. And we do it for this set of um, pixels and then we could move over here and we do it for this set of pixels. But as you can see we also do it for all of the overlapping sets, right? And what we end up with is a new pixel value here and here and here and here and over here and for the entire image really. And this is what we do to, to calculate the box blur. The important thing here is that each one of these boxes of values I'm reading from this image and I'm writing to this image. So basically uh, or for, from this data buffer, I guess I should say, and this and writing to this data buffer to regenerate the image. But the important point here is that each one of these box calculations can be done independent of all of the other ones because I'm reading from here and I'm writing to here. Um, and because, the, again, the data is stored to a separate location, I don't have to worry about um, synchronization or, or you know updating values and this and that and the most important thing is that this is a fair amount of work now this is a, if you were to just go and sum up all of these things that's actually a subpar algorithm there are better ways to do this and and, and we can talk about those things later if it, if it comes up but the, um, the the important thing to keep in mind is that uh, we have to do a lot of work because we have to sum up all these values and then we have to move over a little bit and sum up all these values and then we have to write them over here and we have to do this so this is a very good example of a data parallel type of calculation we would do do or want to do um, that we want to do as quickly um, and cleanly as possible. So, um, so, so this is this again. So this is one example. So, um, how does then um, OpenCL fit into, say, other technologies that we might be interested in? Again, you know, I'm using an image processing as an example here. Um, what about things like graphics and whatnot? So, OpenCL also was really designed to work with um, OpenGL. Uh, OpenGL is a graphics programming language. Most of you uh, probably know this and are, are familiar with it, at least uh, in name. And like I said, OpenGL is also maintained by uh, Kronos. Um, and the, the really great thing about OpenCL is that OpenCL is designed to be the numerical number crunching part of the graphics programming language, which is OpenGL. They're, they're sort of sister languages, uh, sister technologies, I should say. And um, they were designed, uh, OpenCL was designed, I should say. OpenGL has been around for a long time. OpenCL was designed so that you don't have to worry about um, data um, you don't have to worry about the details of getting data from one to the other. That is to say that OpenCL can share data with OpenGL because they use the exact same bits. So if you set up your, your, your calculation properly and you go through the, the proper steps, you can create a buffer to use an OpenCL to, to crunch some numbers on. And then let's say you want to display those, not those values. Uh, you just feed it off to OpenGL and OpenGL knows what to do with it. And it, and it, it does, it does its thing. The important thing, and I'm going to show you an example here actually at the end of this uh, podcast of that and so you can kind of see it and get a feel for what that really means um, and then the important thing to keep in mind is that when you do this kind of thing you really get um, very little performance overhead um, from from this kind of setup and so that's really nice you can do number crunching you can do displays beautiful displays you can do all of that kind of stuff and you don't really have to worry about a lot of overhead um, in, in, in doing this so it's all very transparent now um, what are the kinds of things I'm telling you, you know, all this stuff, you know, OpenCL is great, you can do all this. What are the kinds of things that you really can't use OpenCL for? Well, the first and foremost things are sequential problems. Sequential problems that are not inherently parallel um, are going to be bad choices for OpenCL. You're just not going to get the performance that you want out of it. And you can either, hopefully, you can find some other way to refactor your problem or uh, find another algorithm that might work better for you. But if you're really stuck with a sequential problem, you're going to have, you're going to have, um, you're not going to have much use for OpenCL, unfortunately. Um, another, you know, a common example I think that people refer to is uh, Huffman decoding is one example, but there's there's a myriad of them uh, that it's just simply not possible to use OpenCL for. Um, calculations that require a lot of synchronization points, where you're constantly having to communicate data back and forth and whatnot, probably also are not very good for OpenCL. There are ways to synchronize certain kinds of calculations. Um, but uh, you don't really want to rely on those. You really want your data to be as independent as possible and then kind of go from there and, and do those, do those uh, uh, 
do those kinds of calculations with OpenCL that just can go and do their own thing and then come back and sort of report the results. And then there are also device-dependent limitations, which depending on the type of calculation that you do and what, you, what kind of factors and, and special you know, handling you might need from a device, you might not be able to use OpenCL for either. And, and we'll, we'll talk about those things as they come up um, in, in subsequent podcasts. So um, the point being that not everything is going to work well with OpenCL, and that's okay. OpenCL is not designed to be the kitchen sink. OpenCL is designed to really solve a problem, which is how do we take advantage of as much of the computational power in our computers um, you know, as easily and portably and simply as possible and, 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 and go from there. So talking about this, and we're talking a little bit, we talked a little bit about, you know, compute devices. I've mentioned GPUs uh, a little bit. Um, OpenCL is often sort of compared against uh, uh, CUDA. And so, this, uh, you know, so what about CUDA? Um, CUDA, for those of you who don't know, is a very, very powerful advanced GP, uh, GPU programming interface for um, running calculations on graphics cards. And in fact, it's probably one of the uh, it, it, it's a great success story. It's one of the things that has really driven um, computation on GPUs and really made it mainstream. That's allowed people to get access to all this computing power without having to do, you know, rewrite their code using OpenGL and OpenGL shaders and frag, you know, fragment shaders, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do any of that stuff with CUDA. I mean, it's base, it's C, C++, and you just have to use some special decorators and semantics, but, you know, you really get in there and you can get your code running on a GPU you know, phenomenally. Uh, so it's really, really been a, a great, um, a, a great tool, a great, great thing to come about. But there, there are a couple of issues uh, that one needs to consider. And the first is that CUDA is not device agnostic. That is, it only works on NVIDIA hardware. Um, it's, it's maintained by NVIDIA. It's NVIDIA's, you know, invention. It's, it's theirs. It's their baby. Um, so if you, if you go the CUDA route, you are, primarily dealing talking about NVIDIA hardware. Luckily, they sell a lot of graphics cards. Um, so the probability that you can use it someplace uh, is, is, is very high. Um, and of course, it's vendor controlled. They control the whole thing. So you, there's, there's, no, um, there's, there's no ability for you to do your own CUDA implementation, let's say, or something like that. But um, that being said, though, this isn't an issue of where you have to say, okay, I'm either going to use CUDA or I'm going to use OpenCL. You can use both. And in fact, the hardest part, as we'll talk about in later podcasts, about really getting all of this stuff going isn't the, the underlying frameworks. They make the, you know, CUDA, uh, NVIDIA and Apple and all of these companies, you know, for OpenCL really make the underlying part, you know, getting the thing going easy. The, um, the hard part really comes from where we, uh, when we have to write kernels and we have to do that and even then in some cases it's very trivial to do and I'm going to give you an example uh, show you an example today but give you details on it later of you know very simple simple things that you can do to, in, to really get some great performance right away but the point being that going from CUDA to OpenCL isn't really that hard because when you get down to the kernels the kernels are pretty much the same it's just some minor modifications for some uh, language semantics but other than that I mean Whatever you invest in one, you're going to be able to sort of reap the benefits pretty quickly and easily in, in the other. So you're not really locked in, and, and, and that's the most important point. So OpenCL, how do we get to it? How do we use it? Where do we get it from? OpenCL, um, the first implementation, the first major rollout implementation um, is going to be in Mac OS X Snow Leopard 10.6, which will come out August 28th, or will have come out on August 28th, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, it's being supplied as a system framework, which means that uh, it will ship and it will be there on every copy of Mac OS 10.6 or higher um, from then on out. So you don't have to do anything. If you're a developer writing an application, it's there. Uh, you write your application, you use it, you use the, the technology and the framework, and if your users are running 10.6, it'll go. If they're not using 10.6, well, and you haven't done the right things, of course, it'll crash, but um, uh, but we're not going to worry about those things. All of our users are going to be on 10.6, and so that's the way it'll be. But anyway, that'll be the first major rollout. A NVIDIA, AMD also are working on their own implementations. NVIDIA has been beta testing. Um, there's for, for quite some time as well. So uh, there, there are multiple avenues, and that will also get you um, access perhaps to other operating systems, other platforms, uh, things like that. So those are a couple implementations. So what computers now, of course, are going to be capable of doing OpenCL calculations? Well, um, 
this being you know Mac research, Mac, we're talking about primarily Apple computers. This is kind of the way it's going to, all of these podcasts are going to be geared around Apple and Apple technology and Apple's implementation. But um, what are OpenCL capable computers? Well, if you have a computer, um, a, a, a Mac uh, that's running 10.6 or higher, you have a computer that's OpenCL capable because, of course, it has a CPU. Um, if you want access to the GPU, uh, you might need, you'll need a newer one. You'll, you'll uh, need uh, either a Mac Pro. And certainly all the new Mac Pros that are coming out have, uh, are shipping with cards that are OpenCL capable. Uh, the 24-inch iMac is OpenCL capable. Some of the MacBook Pros, certainly all the new ones, uh, the ones with the black bezels on them, the, uh, some of the previous generation, I think, um, uh, MacBook Pros, the all-silver ones as well, I think are... Um, uh, I think I think are, are also capable. I'm not I'm not 100% certain what the exact models are, but um, you'll always be able to run an OpenCL type calculation on on, on a Mac as long as it's running 10.6. Um, all currently shipping uh, cards from NVIDIA are OpenCL capable. Um, they ship I think the numbers I saw last were like one to two million cards uh, a month a week. I can't remember what some ob obnoxiously huge number. I mean it's just amazing, you know. So anyway, so there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of GPUs out there and uh, that can, that are OpenCL capable. So this is a really great technology. It's a great time to get in to using the technology. But again, this is Apple Mac related, so we're going to really focus on um, Apples and Macs. And let me just give you a really quick idea of where things sit in Snow Leopard. Um, there's you know Darwin, uh, which is the underlying sort of Unix. Uh, BSD layer. And then on top of that, Apple has built a whole range of technologies, a whole, whole, whole lot of different things from, um, you know, I.O. to uh, graphics and media to, you know, you name it, it's, it's, it's there mostly. Um, and in the graphics and media section, uh, there are a lot of uh, very powerful technologies, QuickTime, uh, Core Video, Core Image, OpenGL, things like that, that really um, allow developers to write um, really full, featured, you know, rich applications without having to reinvent the wheel every time and to take advantage of all these technologies that Apple has, has um, really, really um, uh, made shine. Um, so OpenCL fits into that same sort of framework. It's in the graphics and media um, sort of hierarchy bundle because it's so well tied to OpenGL and, um, and, and things like that. And really because, you know, when we think of OpenCL, primarily what people are thinking about is how do we get access to the GPU easily. I mean, we've been developing on CPUs for so long. Uh, people, are, people are used to the programming paradigms there. But how do we really get access to the GPU and make it easy? And so this kind of begs the question, of course, why the fuss over the GPU? Um, and I've sort of hinted at this, but, you know, GPUs are um, floating point monsters. They're designed to crunch numbers. Um, they're very highly um, scalable in terms of you know when they're building these things out so if you have an algorithm that's um, data parallel and you've optimized it well for for being parallel it's gonna per it, you know it can perform very well and it will scale well as more powerful GPUs um, are, are rolled off the production line and things like that and and let me just give you one really quick um, sort of idea if we compare say the core 2 duo over here, which is you know the standard CPU in, in most Macs now, um, we're talking about you know 45 gigaflops of um, uh, of computing power on a, on a Core 2 Duo. Whereas when we compare, say, the top of the line, close to the top of the line Nvidia card, the GTX 285, we're almost talking about a teraflop. And this graphics card, you might think, oh, it must cost a fortune. I mean, you can get this graphics card for three or four hundred dollars. I mean, it's not super expensive. Um, but there's there's a massive amount of bandwidth internally to the card, and there's a massive amount of floating point uh, computational power if you can if you have a problem that can really sort of take advantage of that. Um, but there's also some limitations and some things that you want to be aware of before you get you know crazy excited about you know uh, all of this unharnessed uh, uh, computational machinery there, um, and that's uh, that. One of the things that you have to consider is that when you try to get data from your, the main part of your computer over to the graphics card, it has to go over the PCI bus, and uh, that's really slow um, compared to certainly the internal bus or the internal speed of memory on the, the, the graphics card, which is, again, very, very fast. Um, and as an example, uh, sort of point out that, you know, just just to kind of give you, we won't go through the whole thing, but, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, 
the PCI bus supports about three to four gigabytes per second of data transfer. And on a three gigahertz machine, let's say three gigabytes per second, that gets us to about one byte of data transfer per clock tick, okay? And during that time it would take to, say, copy 16 bytes of data, I mean, a useful amount of data that you could do something with, say, like add, you know, two double precision numbers uh, together, for example, or four um, single precision numbers together or whatnot, what could you have done on the CPU? Well, you could have done all of these things that are listed right here on the CPU in the same amount of time it would take to copy, just to copy, 16 bytes of data from the from say the system side over to the GPU so you really need to sit here and think you know do I want to go and invest some effort in this do I have a problem that is computationally um, expensive enough to justify this kind of overhead and we'll talk about those kinds of things as the podcast go on but it's something to think about the other things you really want to think about or should know and I pretty sure these things are going to get better over time, is that GPUs aren't really smart. All of the sophisticated error, error handling and debugging and things that we're used to on the CPU really aren't that mature on the GPU yet and readily available yet. Um, they will be, but, um, you know, right now it's, 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 it's kind of tough. And so there, there are some tricks and there are some things that you can do to, to, to debug and to get some ideas in terms of how things are working. And we'll talk about those in later podcasts as well. Um, the other thing is that I want to point out is that GPUs also like their data organized in really, really specific ways. Um, you need to, uh, to, to really take advantage of them. You, the things that we do for um, simplicity or for, you know, human organization, like in our minds to sort of abstract and, and, um, uh, rationalize you know how we've laid out our data and things like that on the CPU side uh, we really can't get away with on the GPU the GPUs really like things a very particular way and if you do them their way then you're gonna get um, you're gonna you're gonna reap the, the the rewards of, of having played by their rules and and really get some awesome performance out of um, out of the uh, GPU. So um, those are those are some things to consider. Nothing, you know, nothing that's you know uh, y you can't work around or that you can't um, deal with, but just things to be aware of. So OpenCL. Um, again, it's an open specification. It's designed to be device agnostic to really get make it so that every every computational device in your system can be uh, used together and um, or so that you can get access to it easily using the same kind of programming paradigm I should say I think that's probably the more important thing of course it's portable uh, because it's an open specification anybody can write their own implementation um, and it makes programming for on the GPU uh, much easier and uh, in the case of Apple uh, they're doing a great thing with 10.6 it's gonna be a standard part of the OS so if you're a developer you don't have to worry about installing anything or having your users install anything or whatnot. I mean, it's all there, and it's well integrated with a lot of the other technologies that they've rolled out in 10.6 that are under the hood, all of these changes they've made to really make the performance of the OS much, much faster and much better, and uh, it's just it's just amazing technology, I think, and I think as uh, time goes on, people are going to really appreciate all of the work that's gone into this release, so, um, so, so that's there, and of course, it also is Absolutely, it's available for other platforms, uh, hardware platforms, and other operating systems. So again, it's not just limited to Apple. But again, since this is Mac research, and uh, you know, this is all about Macs, we're going to be focusing primarily on that. So um, right now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to switch over, and I'd like to show you just a really quick demo um, of OpenCL in action uh, on a real-world type of problem. And hopefully that'll just kind of get you excited about the technology and some of the things that um, you can perhaps even use it for or just to get you thinking and, and moving along that. So I'm going to switch over uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the demo part. We'll do this and, um, and then we'll switch back and then finish up here in a couple minutes. Okay, so um, enough yammering, I guess, about like all the background stuff. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give you a really quick... Uh, demo of OpenCL and hopefully uh, just sort of seeing something will get you excited uh, like a real-world example of something uh, so that way you can really appreciate uh, what the technology can do and, and, and some of the things that you could expect from it uh, if you were to use it in your own stuff and so what we're looking at here is uh, a demo uh, from a, a talk I gave at WWDC this year and it, it really highlights uh, the, the ability to take you know existing code and then to move it from running on the CPU to running on the GPU 
And the really uh, nice thing about this is that it's it's real world code. This is from a program I work on called uh, in my day job that I work on called APBS, and uh, the software is designed to evaluate the electrostatic properties of biological molecules. So for like um, drug delivery uh, systems or, or uh, rational drug design, understanding protein protein interactions, things like that. And one of the things that we have to do in this calculation initially, certainly, is when the, when the calculation is running, uh, one of the stages is we have to set up what are called boundary value conditions. And those um, portions of the calculation uh, can be uh, quite slow if we want to do them as accurately as, we, as, as we're able to. Uh, we have some shortcuts and, and whatnot, but if we really want you know, high accuracy, uh, really good numerical results, uh, we need to do this slower method. And so what you're observing is a visualization of that portion of the calculation. And uh, what you can see is that you know, the calculation uh, for setting up these boundary value uh, problems, for just getting through this one stage, actually takes you know, um, some time. I think this is gonna end up taking about maybe 50 or 60 seconds uh, to complete. And this is running uh, on a single core and a single CPU. This is all C code, um, uh, very, very sort of straightforward stuff. And we'll talk about the actual code and use this as an example in later things. So about uh, you know 50, 56, uh, 57 seconds for that thing to run. So um, on a on a single CPU. This is an eight core Mac Pro. Uh, it's one of the Nihilum systems, so it actually uh, has hyperthreading enabled. So we can get actually sixteen um, like virtual type processors. Uh, cores running. So we can run this on 16 threads. We can parallelize this calculation uh, relatively straightforward, either using OpenMP or OpenCL. Either way, we can we can um, parallelize it on the CPU. And if we run that, um, you can see it runs. It takes advantage of multiple cores. It runs. It does its thing. And we get a pretty good uh, performance boost, uh, 4.7, uh, say 4.8 seconds on 16 CPUs. So that's really, really good. Um, it, it tells us at least that you know we've got a well-defined problem, a parallelizable problem, um, and that we can uh, get additional performance if we have the resources available. Now, what's really interesting though is that we can also do this on the GPU. And uh, what we want to know is, you know, can we get you know more performance and, and, and things like that? And obviously we can, um, but the, uh, the, the the important thing here before I show you this is that I want you to understand is that you know the results that we're going to get on the GPU are identical to the results that we're going to get or that we currently get on the CPU, and I think that's probably one of the more important things is that uh, we're talking about uh, numerical accuracy. So it, basically, what I'm saying is that. Uh, there's no there's no trickery there's no um, mathematical shenanigans or anything going on we're getting the exact same results so let's run that um, on the GPU and the GPU in this case is uh, the GTX 285 from NVIDIA and uh, let's see that and we can do it again and again and again and I can do this all day and so what you can see is we took a calculation that was running took about 60 seconds on this system down to about 180 milliseconds um, on a single GPU on a single graphics card which is phenomenal I think and I think it really sort of uh, goes to show you that uh, you can you can really really get a lot of you know floating point and numerical performance out of these cards and and the other thing to, to point out not only is there no mathematical trickery but the code that we're using over here on the CPU is pretty much uh, the exact same code that we're using on the GPU. There's some slight modifications just to kind of uh, to get like a little bit extra performance out of it, but by and large we're talking about exactly the same co code from C to an OpenCL kernel. And like I said in later podcasts and whatnot, we'll, we'll we'll talk about those and you know how you go from one to the other. And I'll give you you know plenty of examples and uh, show you how to you know uh, some techniques for optimizing these things and whatnot. But anyway, I just wanted to I wanted to kind of show you this demo because I think again it really sort of highlights the the power of the technology and hopefully it'll kind of get you excited and thinking about some of the things that you can do in your own code and your own work uh, with with this technology. So we'll switch back to the podcast uh, now and then we'll go um, and then we'll finish up. Okay, so hopefully from um, what you just saw, I, I hope hope you're really excited. I hope I hope that was kind of something that's really sort of compelling that kind of shows you that you can really um, you can really do a lot with the technology and you can really do some do some some phenomenal stuff that makes uh, ac getting access to all of these computational resources, you know, um, 
much much easier and i'm really excited every time i you know watch this or or not this particular podcast but i mean when i watch you know like the you know these things that you know we're building using OpenCL, it just really really you know it's just things we wouldn't have thought of even six nine months ago um uh, well, actually i should probably say a little bit more than nine months ago maybe even a year ago now i mean um you know w- things we just sort of you know had, had written off we never um uh you know, you know we um we're doing now and and i think that's really exciting i think that that really is uh, is, a, is a good thing it's a good thing for science it's a good thing for us uh it's a good thing for our users the people who use our software i think so um hopefully hopefully you feel that way too um i'd like to point out a few things uh just real real quick and then we'll end this um the first is that you know obviously this is being brought to you by macresearch.org uh we're an online community for uh, scientists using macs but there's a lot of uh, great stuff and a lot of great things people talk about on our on our site um it's an open community people are welcome to join and participate and and do things we we try to um uh you know talk about things that we think are going to be interest you know primarily to scientists and scientists on the max but uh anybody's sort of welcome to uh to to, to stop by um the open cl tutorials will be on mac research dot uh, org these podcasts will be linked there any um additional files like i mentioned at the beginning of the podcast I'll, I'll post up there so you can grab them source code things like that as as, as they're needed just so you can uh, get it from from someplace really easily um, I'd like to point out a couple other things. If you're really looking into getting programming into programming on the Mac, specifically using some of Apple's uh, amazing programming technologies, uh, Drew McCormack has this great uh, um, series called Coco for Scientists. Uh, it's it's up there. It's it's a huge series, start to finish. It's it's really great. Um, and so I, I'd encourage you to check it out. If even if you're just curious, if you have no desire, but you kind of want to see what you know the hubbub is about, uh, you know about Coco, Objective C, and all this kind of stuff. Mac programming, it, it's there, and, and it's not only for scientists. Uh, a lot of people, it, it you know, a lot of people can get um, some benefit from it. It's really well written and put together. The other series, if you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in, say, grid computing and, and, and pr- parallel computing technologies, are the X-Grid tutorials that Charles Parnot has put together. And again, another great series of tutorials uh, written by you know somebody who's who's really a master at this type of stuff. He, he he really he really understands this technology quite well, and he's he's gone together he's gone and put together a great series of stuff. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested in X-Grid, parallel computing, those kinds of things. It's, it's very useful uh, information. And then finally, I'd really like to encourage you, if you, if you find these things useful and, and you're willing to maybe help us out, it does cost us, you know, some time, certainly some money to, you know, have the servers up and running and uh, maintaining hardware and, and, and things like that. And if, you, if you're if you interested in helping us out, we've got an Amazon store. We've got, you know, some software up there. We're adding more things as time goes on. We just put it up. But, you know, if there's something up there that you think you know hey i could buy i was going to get it through amazon anyway if you want to get it through our amazon store it costs you the exact same as if you buy it on uh, the, the main amazon store we get a small percentage of the sale and, and it would really help us out and so we would appreciate that so um with that i would um like to uh end this first podcast i hope it was useful for you and uh next time